We'll kick it off with a Tesla bot. Uh, some of you may have seen a clip of the Tesla bot folding uh, a piece of clothing. Uh, this thing made the rounds uh, for the last few days. Um, Hans and I are, are people that obviously cover the Tesla school, uh, space pretty closely on uh, YouTube and X. My friend Keith here is obviously aware of the company and technology, but it's good to always bring somebody in that's not a maniac like Hans and I are, like crazy people. We actually have some normal, very good people to actually balance out our craziness us here. So we're going to talk about the implications of that technology, what it could mean for the real world, uh, so on and so forth. But I'll, I'll let Hans sort of kick it off. Do you want to maybe give us a little bit of insight into what the technology is doing um, and then sort of your takeaways from what you saw from Tesla? Yeah. So a few years ago, Elon kind of looked at the way that technology was kind of coming together, especially after all of the work that they'd been doing in the car to try and get the car to drive itself with the full self-driving software stack and also kind of looking out at a lot of other parts of technology and realized that it was only a matter of time before we had artificial intelligence robots that could do all kinds of crazy, valuable, cool things. And the car was kind of the tip of the spear for that in his world, but he realized it was going to become a lot more general. It was going to touch a lot more things than that. And so it seems like he settled on the humanoid form factor as being one of the first main um, additional types of robots that didn't really exist to date that would need that. Obviously, a lot of the traditional industrial robots that we have today, those will get a lot better and a lot smarter with artificial intelligence as well. But as far as coming up with a new form factor that has not been successful to date, he wanted to go for the humanoid form factor. And the the challenge of doing a humanoid robot has always been getting good brains. But that was the thing that he was solving with FSD was an incredible robot brain. And so he's like, if we have the brain now, then the humanoid form factor becomes feasible. And not only is it feasible, but, you know, basically the entire world is designed around being accessible and interactable by humans. So if we have a robot that is in the shape of a human, then it can do all kinds of things out of the box if it's smart enough. And so that was kind of the genesis of the project. And they have been working on that ever since. And over the past year, we've seen incredible progress on the development of the hardware for the Optimus robot. And um, the in December, they revealed the Gen 2 prototype, which looks like it is very, very close to being the final design iteration of the hardware of Optimus. There's a lot left to go still on the software end of things. Um, and so then the, uh, the demonstration that they gave us for the folding of laundry was something that was being controlled by a human. And so that really shows us that um, they are working on trying to make the software of Optimus capable of doing these types of tasks that require a lot of coordination and dexterity, feedback with the real world. Um, shirts are obviously very flexible. They're thin. They're delicate. They require a lot of feel. Um, it's not something that you can just program a dumb robot like, go here, go down, pinch, go up, go here, go there, drop. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into that. And right now, the software can't do that task yet, but they wanted to make sure that the hardware could do it. So that's why they're testing these types of operations by remote controlling the Optimus Gen 2 robot with a human, to see if the human who has all of the complex neural net software necessary to do those operations can do them through the physical body of the Optimus robot. And they were able to actually show that yes that is possible and so that really demonstrates the capability of the hardware being at a very high level and that the m most of the challenge that is left to solve now is the software challenge um, but then the other piece that we also know based on looking at a lot of different technology that's out there today is that these software challenges are becoming easier and easier to solve and we've seen uh, like there's a robot project at Stanford uh, that's a couple of grad students called Mobile Aloha. And they were able to show that 
in a very specific situation. So like, you know, they could spill wine from a specific wine cup in a specific place and that they could show a robot how to clean up that wine spill in that exact spot over and over again. And that if they did it 50 times, that then they could teach through artificial intelligence that robot to clean up that spill and it would actually be able to get it right about 80 percent of the time but then as soon as you take it to a different place you know a different countertop or a different area in the room or something else well all of a sudden it can't do that task anymore yet and so making that ability something that is really general is the challenge that they're working on next but that's where tesla is in a very unique place because they have the foundation of working on full self-driving which they are building and have always been building to operate in a very universal way that it can drive in china and the united states it can drive in canada and india and argentina and all these places and so they have expertise that not a lot of other people have in trying to apply this advanced artificial intelligence software to general environments and they're trying to bring that now to the bot and then they also have the experience as a manufacturer of vehicles at large scale in actually making physical products uh, to a high degree of quality and at high scale and so they're really in a cool place in the overall landscape of um, being able to make these robots and obviously the opportunities that this affords and also the disruption that this signals for humanity for society for culture um it's pretty incredible i think that we're looking at the next 10 to 15 years society and culture will probably be changed more dramatically than they have been over the past 15 years by the iphone and so that's why we look at this technology pay attention to it closely and really try and understand it because we realize that there's going to be a lot of things that we assumed were always going to be true because they have been true in our past that are not actually not going to be true moving forward and a lot of things that will be true in the future that were never true in the past and um, you know trying to really differentiate between the two and understand what opportunities that that affords to us and then the ways that we actually need to be careful about our assumptions so that we don't end up being dramatically wrong and you know put ourselves in a bad situation so dumb question for you there hans you talk about the fsd obviously full driving incredible and some of the ways that it's translating into other you know realms as you pointed out with laundry and so on and so forth like so what are some of the ways that that's being impacted is it just more of a its ability to learn by looking at less situations or is it looking at the data that's already collected and or is it a processing thing and how what its ability to process and and how fast it is versus how fast it's growing impact you know kind of the growth and where it's going if that makes sense yeah so the um they really do have two two pieces of things that they're working on as they're doing this folding of laundry task that is operated by a human one of them is that they are trying to give it pr training data and so there is a different um, video that they put out last year of a previous version of the Optimus robot and they had it sorting blocks and so they would put like six big Duplo Lego blocks out and it would have to pick up two different colors there was green ones and blue ones and it put the blue ones in a blue bin and the green ones in a green bin and it would actually turn them up you know they would be dropped in a random orientation and it would have to put them in the box right side up so we'd have to turn them and manipulate them and all that stuff. Yeah, because that's my biggest question is, are, are we using the data that we've collected through FSD or is it the ability to learn that is really being leveraged such as like, I can knock it out in much fewer you know, examples because I've learned so much. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, which one is it? That's a great question. Um, so it's going to learn much faster in the future. And the thing that they did with the blocks is, they had humans do that telerobotically, just like they're doing right now with the folding of the laundry a number of times. But eventually, just by doing that, then the robot was able to learn to do it autonomously. 
And it's going to start out where we're doing a lot of those individual tasks very much like that. So where each each thing you'll have to learn, but it's not going to be generalized. Anytime you turn you teach it that it's going to be slow. But over time, what they have done with uh, full self driving is that's kind of where they started with full self driving as well. Um, and not necessarily in a neural net coded way. So it was less artificial intelligence. It was more traditional software programming. But they were doing that type of overall architecture where they're looking at a specific problem and they would solve that one specific problem locally. And then over time, they were able to make that more and more general. Um, one of the things that we know about full self-driving today is that they're able to do a lot of automatic learning at scale across the entire like training data that they have available to them through the entire fleet of the cars. And as they grow the fleet of Optimus, they will be able to do the same thing. And that's really when we'll see the learning scale that um, as they first, they kind of have to get the, the software architecture good enough for these bots to be able to walk around by themselves and not fall down. That's one of the challenges that they have is they have to keep these things on a gantry right now. And so they can't really let them loose in a factory to go learn stuff. Um, even even if they're being controlled by a human, I think they still like, I don't think they've even figured out telerobotic walking that doesn't fall down periodically. And so um, once they solve those problems, then they can start really increasing the number of these that they have out in the learning environment. And then the more there are that can learn at the same time, the more data that they can get. Um, I think right now they're in the phase of building up the data flywheel for Optimus that they have already built up that data flywheel for FSD. So walking is hard. Just ask my toddler. Walking is hard. You fall down all the time. It is what it is. Shocking how hard it <laughs> <Yeah>. is. <laughs> it, it's it's horrible and also comical at the same time, but it is not it is not easy. So to answer to so what I'm hearing you say is that is not necessarily the data that you've collected with FSD, more of the collective ability to learn and share it with other like-minded AI that is really what's going to put them ahead. Is that what I'm like, like learning that, how to learn? Yes. So the data it's learned. Yes. Learning how to learn is going to be a, one of them and having the right architecture that can learn by itself. Once they have the data pipeline set up that now they know how to, once you have a giant pool of data, they know how to build a system that can learn from a giant pool of data and constantly update itself, constantly um, get better and not only get better, but get better faster. And they know how to solve all these challenges. Yeah. So like if I give you like use your toddler as an example. So Keith has a has a six year old, a four year old and a one and a half year old. Right. And and so when when the one and a half year old is when he learned how to walk, right? Mm -hmm. He learned how to walk by a mixture of it's sort of like embedded in our system somehow in our mm -hmm. DNA mm -hmm. to be able to learn how to walk. Yep. But then also um, how he learned how to walk faster, how he learned how to walk more smoothly without having to fall down. That was repetition. Yeah, it was, and like it was, watching it was. other people do it as well, right? It's mm -hmm. like literally the same exact framework that's that humans use to learn. Yeah. The the breakthrough here is that uh, it seems like Tesla's on the route to figure out how to put that in a in a in a machine so yeah. that the machine learns through observation and through practice. And then there's this thing, and then Hans is more knowledgeable here. This this, this thing called inference that it kind of can take all that data that it has collected and it can make new decisions mm -hmm. based on the data it already has that is the correct decision and it doesn't necessarily have to even see that situation in the past. But what's really interesting to me that Hans yeah. pointed out was, I mean, that all of that is undoubtedly true, but uh, it sounds like there's some kind of community learning where it can take that data and share that data 100%. to where you have more people or more in this case, more machines learning, which is going to be that give that correct. exponential effect. Is that correct? Yes. Hans? 100%. Yeah, which is so like if one bot learns how to fold laundry, mm -hmm. all bots know how to fold laundry. And you if, have an army of laundry bots. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that um, I do want to put a fine point on that people really underestimate is just how hard it is to learn to walk. And there are advantages that we have as people in learning to walk that, you know, when you learn to walk, you're like a foot to two feet tall. 
and you weigh like 25 pounds and your bones are squishy. And so when you fall down and you fail over and over and over and over and over again, you don't get broken. Right now, these robots, they're almost six feet tall. They weigh 130 pounds. They do not have flexible bones and they cost millions of freaking dollars. <laughs> yeah. And when they fall down and break, it's really expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. That's very, very true. So so based on everything you've heard so far, like what? So where does your where does your brain take you? Like, where, where's your head at with this? No, I mean, again, just the community learning and the exponential community learning really drives home why we were talking about in a previous podcast, just why everything is exponentially growing. I think that's the big the, the community aspect of it that I was not aware of. Yeah, it's just a non Tesla, you know, AI yeah. person, I, I find really fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah, as for and as for, you know, folding clothes, it, it's cool because I, I'll be honest, when I saw folding clothes, I wasn't initially impressed because I'm like, because I actually I'm in IT consulting. And to me, it's you have X requirements, you can train them to do these things. So on its face, it doesn't look that difficult. But when you put in texture and you put in just how wavy, like some cloth or like, you know, God help me, a fitted sheet or something, <laughs> you yeah. know, then I can understand why that would be a much bigger task.